morning. We have a special treat today. I'm not going to tell you about it right now, but we're so happy to have uh, you listening this morning as we prepare for Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a day that we recognize all those who have fought in the wars, those who were wounded, those who passed on. We thank God for their, their service. All the time we think this holiday is just a day off. But being a Vietnam vet, it means very much to me, so much to me, how people just stop and pause and begin to thank those who made the ultimate sacrifice who have never lived to say hello after war. We have a lot of brothers and some of the sisters that were in the military that could not even cope with coming back to the nation found that they dealt with PTSD and other ailments, some were wounded, wounded warriors. Sometimes we are not appreciated. But I thank God for my time in the service and made me a better man to appreciate what I had in life. Even though sometimes it felt like we would never make it, but we're still here by the grace of God. We want to uh, Again, thank you for tuning in today. On well, tomorrow is a holiday. Is that that's the thirtieth or the first? The thirtieth. The thirtieth. Okay, we we are celebrating tomorrow. And I hope you remember when we come together tomorrow that you pray for the wounded, yeah. not only for those that are wounded, but those families who have lost loved ones in the military, in the army, in the air force, in the Marine Corps, the Navy. That you remember them in your prayers to their families. So as I pray, I'm going to just bring a scripture before us today. Uh, we're going to ask, um, well, I do it myself. Let me get my Bible. If you have your Bible, put, put your. Let's see. I want to read the scripture that is. For today, for well, our preachers going to deal with chapter uh, the 24th number of Psalm. And let's look at a very familiar text. Let's look at Psalm 23. Very familiar text. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He is me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Shall we pray? Gracious Lord, it is again that we come before your hallowed presence. Thank you for life, health, and strength. You woke us, woke us up early this morning. Like our ancestors would pray, clothed and in our right mind. Yes, Jesus. You did not have to do it, but you did. We thank you, dear God, that our bed was not our cooling board. And our cover, our cover was not our, our winding cloth. We thank you because when we got up this morning, we have a response. With our response is God is good. And God is worthy to be praised. And God, we thank you because we thank you for saving us from the doom of hell. You saved us through your word. And you put your word in us that we should walk the circumspectly of the world. God, we thank you for delivering us from seen and unseen dangers. When we did not know that we was in the midst of a pandemic that took so many souls, God, you spared us. You spared us to celebrate life. You spared us that we would give you the glory in every step we take. You spared us so that we would lift our hands and give praises to you. Even if we're not in a sanctuary, 
But God, you turned our houses into sanctuaries. Even during a pandemic, we learned to praise your name all over our homes, in our communities, over our children, over our grandchildren. God, you spared us. And for that, we give you thanks. You did not have to do it, but you did. You kept us walking in faith. We know faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But we have not seen some things these days because I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor is seed begging in the bread. Thank you, dear God, for walking with us. Thank you, God, for wrapping your loving arms around us. Thank you, God, for keeping us when we really could not keep ourselves. Thank you, God, for putting food on our table, even in the pandemic. Thank you, God, for healing us, even in the pandemic. Thank you, God, for keeping us from seeing and unseen dangers. I keep saying that because there has been some dangers on the road. There has been some folk that have been hurt, but we are still here. There have been some folk that committed suicide, but we're still here. There are some people that did not know you by the three parts of their, of their sin. But God, you saved us that we will be an example to those that are lost. God, we thank you right now again, over and over. We just can't thank you enough. If we had a thousand tongues, we would thank you enough. Thank you for the mouth of the family. Thank you for the other children that are holding in your name. Thank you for these that are here today. This man that's going to pray, preach before us today. Hold him up, Lord, as you always have done in the years to pass. But instead, let him be an oracle of divine name. That whatever he says, that somebody might come saying, what must I do to be saved? You gave him a voice, you You gave him the knowledge, you You gave him the spirit. Now, God, push him today. Push him. Press him. That some man, some woman, child, boy, or girl, who comes in, I yield, I yield. I give my life to you. It is in the melodious, magnificent, powerful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. To God be the glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to do this uh, real quick. I know you're at home and I know you already have your offerings. We have several ways to give. We give the gift of fire. I don't have to repeat that. I think we know the techniques and the way we're doing that. We give the fire for the church as well as for the 1930 project. And if you still have time, you can come to the church between now and 1 o'clock and drop your offerings off. We want to thank you so much for those who have participated in the 1930 program, uh, project or campaign, however you want to say it. There have been people from around the country that have been sowing seeds. Now, we have to do even better because this is our church. Right. And what we're doing is for the coming generations to come that we will have a, a magnificent uh, sanctuary for years to come. Don't forget, wherever you sow, your name will be placed on that wall of faith. So your children and your children's children say, look, that's my granddaddy. He gave in time 2003, that will be seen in infamy, even to the year 2030, 2040. Now, I happen to be here in 2050, I'm just saying. <laughs> Praise his holy name. I want that wall to be so big that everybody is participating. Listen, we're not talking about uh, equal giving. It's equal sacrifice. What will be a sacrifice for me may not be a sacrifice for you. But whatever you give, little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands. I want to pray over that. You do that as well. Pray over your offering that God would multiply it. Whatever you give. Now listen, we want to make sure you understand that this offerings are so important because we're a little behind. We should be about 50-60% of our goal but we're close to it. So please, ma'am, if you have not participated, ask God to move you. Now, the government gave you, uh, what do they call that money? The stimulus, right. So let's stimulate the church. Sit a little, take a little bit of your money that you was, uh, that got you that stimulus, right? I didn't get anything. I don't know why, but, uh, I don't 
make that much money, but you know, they didn't give me one. I don't know why. I might need to pray about it. But whatever you give, if you want to donate something toward that end, please, ma'am, please, so God will bless you. Because little becomes much when you put it in the master's hand. I'm going to thank you and invest about what you're going to do because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Have you ever seen anybody jump and click their heels? That's the kind of giving God likes that you give it. Click your heels. Look what I've done. And you might be able to bring your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. When we have that wall of faith and find your name or whatever, this is what your grandmama did. All right, God bless you. They had a smile. What are you going to have?
associate ministers have an opportunity to stand before you on uh, the fifth Sunday. There is no exception. We have one young man by the name of uh, Stefan Ramon. Oh. He's coming in his way today. He is a native of Columbus. He is the son of, of his father. Of course, Stefan Sr. We are so excited to be able to hear him this morning. Of course, he is a native of Columbus, Ohio. He graduated from, I believe, it is St. Francis de Sales in 2015. He's a young man. He matriculated to North Carolina uh, at a graduated with a degree in civil engineering. So let us know that he is very, very smart. The fact of the matter is, when, when he was in college, he did not succumb to himself and get caught up into the trappings. Usually when we go away to school, away from mom and dad, and that gear, and so sometimes we go left the center. But he found a church. He found a church to go to, matter of fact, and I'm thankful that he did because he went to the Mercy, uh, Mercy Hill Baptist Church, and uh, which was a Southern Baptist Church, and uh, under the still leadership of this pastor Andrew Harper. And when he was there, he began to not just hang around to be around, but he found the church. And as he's at the church, he began to his ministry. He was teaching the Bible to his cohort, and they come together, they would pray together, they would work together. Uh, he worked with the young adults and some of the children while he was there. So let us know that he had a calling. One of the things about the Word of God, Jeremiah always let us know that he has something for us in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. He said, For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's what the Lord God has prepared for this young man. He is of age. He preaches an initial sermon before his brother preaches uh, March 8th, I believe March 6th of this year. And he was very stellar and exciting. So you're in for a great treat this morning. One of our own, Columbus's own, Stefan Ramon Douglas Jr. Pray for him as he comes in his own way. He's of age. Speak for Come on, let me go. Good morning, good Mount Hermon Missionary Baptist Church. It's a joy to be able to come before you and to be able to bring the word before you. Um, and before I even dive into my sermon, I first want to give my public thanks. Um, to the pastor and bishop of this house, uh, Bishop Donald J. Washington, as he has been a blessing to me and my family. And many of my aunts and family members that came to faith under his leadership, which only speaks of the, of the breadth of his ministry. Um, and I thank you for that. And also, I want to thank you for providing me this opportunity to be able to preach, um, as this was actually an answered prayer um, from my grandfather. Um, before he passed away, he had prayed not only that I would preach, but I would be preaching behind this sacred desk. So I thank you. Um, I thank God for the fact that I get to be able to bring the word before you today. And before I get started, I would just like to breathe the word of prayer. Most gracious and heavenly God, Father, we thank you. We thank you for today, God, as you have predestined, Lord. You have ordained this moment, Father, and only you, only you, Father, are the one who can awaken a dead soul and bring it to life yes, Lord. and call him not only to be able to serve you, yes, Lord, amongst the body, but to be able to preach your word, Lord. Yes, Lord. So, Father, I pray that you would empower me with boldness. Give me the boldness as you did me. Yes, Lord. Give me the clarity as you did Ezra when the people asked for him to bring the book. Yes, Give me a voice, Lord, to heart like the angels. Yes, Lord. Oh, my God. The magnificent works of God. Lord, we love you. We praise you, Lord. I pray, Father, that you may help me to preach to an audience of one, that being you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would bring dead souls to life, God, through the preaching of your word as you have done throughout the ages. Lord, your word is sufficient. Your blood still saves, Father. And I pray that your glory will go out to all those who hear this, Lord, and amongst 
the nations. But these are all prayers. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open it up to the book of Psalms. And we will be looking at Psalms 24. Psalms 24. Growing up, one of the most memorable mo movies for me that always showed on TV was the movie Coming to America, starring Eddie Murphy and Arsino Hall. The story is about an African prince where him and his friend were going to find him a wife. But while they were there, they ended up getting regular jobs at McDowell's, which was a knockoff of McDonald's. <laughs> and where the prince eventually would find his wife to be, and lo and behold, the daughter of his boss is actually the one who he ends up falling in love with. Right. But the boss wasn't a fan of this. He wasn't a fan of the daughter marrying a poor man and completely disproved of it. But once the prince's father, the king, had stopped by to find their son, the gears for him started to click. From thinking that this king had nothing to offer, he now sees that this was exactly what him and his family needed. From thinking this prince was getting in the way of his daughter's life and future, he now sees how this will work out for her flourishing. From thinking that the prince was just some nobody and just an extra hand, he now sees the, the king is someone worthy to be esteemed. But because he was tirelessly driven by riches, he failed to seek majesty and proceed to looking at him. In the face church, when we refuse to recognize God for who he truly is, yeah, right. it can lead to wasted energy, burnt affections, taking our fellowship with God for granted because we place something or someone on the throne of our hearts that doesn't belong to be there. Mm. Right. And the sad truth is that if we leave this unchecked, it can lead to it can lead us to miss out on all that God has in store for us, or even worse. Miss out when partaking in his glory in the future. Whatever we give the most weight to is whatever we find is most glorious. Right. Right. Whatever has our attention eventually has our affections. And whether we'll admit it, there is something or someone that sits on the throne of all of our hearts. Ah. It's shaping our motives, driving our decisions, being the topic of our discussion. But my question to you, as David shows us today, is, is it the king of glory? Ah, Which brings us to your text. Psalm 24, Psalm 24. The text reads, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. For he is established, for he is founded upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall ascend, who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully? Yes, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? But the Lord, <laughs> the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. What David shows to us here is that there's already a king enthroned in the heavens. But have we set him as the throne and the king on the throne and the king of our hearts? And as we think about the future of this church, the church of Jesus Christ will never be effective in our service to God, our witness in the world, or in our personal growth and being more like him if we neglect to start with understanding who the king of glory truly is. And in songs like this, they remind us of who is the king who is worthy of all praise, worthy of all esteem, a king who is glorious. If you've been walking with God for any amount of time, you know the scripture usually calls probably about three different applications. Mm -hmm. One is that we would end up behaving. Mm -hmm. The second one is that we would call it would call us to believe, but with this passage that I love about it does here is that it calls us to behold. Behold. David in Psalm 24 gives us three truths about our glorious king that ought to shape our motives. That ought to shape our decisions and ought to propel us to witness and most of all elevate our hearts to soar in worship. Those three truths is that one that the King of Glory is Lord over all. In verses one through two, in verses three through six, we see that He is holy and desires nothing less than our holiness. And in verses seven through ten, we see that this King of Glory, which is the point and subject 
of this sex. Yes. This king of glory is worthy to be praised. Truth number one, the king of glory is the Lord over all. If you're taking notes, we start to see um, in verses one through, one through two that this king of glory is Lord over all. In verse one, it reads, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein, David boldly declares that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In this bold declaration, David acknowledges that this king of glory is Lord over all because he is the sovereign ruler over all things. Oh, God. David here starts off this psalm by praising God as creator king. Well, Before the church had hymns, they had psalms. And this psalm was an entrance liturgy song that would prepare one's heart for worship and praise God as the sovereign ruler over all things. We're not sure exactly when this song was written, but it was most likely written in 2 Samuel 6, where David gathered 30,000 yeah. men right. to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was the symbol for God's presence, and it had been taken captive by the hands of the Philistines. And in 2 Samuel chapter 5, mm -hmm. David was troubled and inquired of the Lord and prayed a bold prayer. Mm -hmm. And he had asked if the Lord would give them into his hands, and God assured of them victory. And fulfilled his request. So David was the one who led the army into battle. Here in Psalm 24, he acknowledges that it was the sovereignty of God that gave him the victory in his hands. That death, life, and victory were all brought about by the sovereign hand of God. So when David starts off this psalm by reminding the people of the God who created the worlds, yeah. he ends up, we ought to be able to take a cue from him. That true worship starts with God right. and recognizing his yeah. lordship over all things. Think about the way how the Bible opens up in Genesis where it says, in the beginning, God. God. Right. Right. If you want to know deep truths about God, just meditate on that one simple truth. That in the beginning, there was God. Yes, sir. Before him was nothing and everything started with him. By him, he created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, there was God. And even before time began, God existed. God. He spoke and galaxies were formed. He breathed and life was given. He made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its blanket. All of life came to be by obeying the voice of God's yeah, decree. Right. Yeah, yeah. Moses in Psalm 90 verse 2, he says, Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Acts 17, Paul says in this way, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord and over heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God is creator and king. He is not dependent on anything. God didn't have to overcome an opposition to be crowned king of the universe. Before things were, he was. He didn't have to run for office or build a campaign. Nothing was above him. Everything was under him. The king of glory is glorious because he is the sovereign ruler over all things. And why is he this sovereign Lord over all things? Well, verses 1, verse 1 through 2 tells us it's because he created everything. In verse 2, it says that for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Referring back to verse 1, he is the creator and sustainer over all things. In other words, when we was in Sunday school, our teachers was teaching us right when they said he's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> what David wanted to remind the people of Israel is that this same God who brought them victory over the Philistines was the same God who laid the foundations of the earth. Now, what do these verses imply for us? That this king of glory is worthy over all we possess. The one who created everything is the owner of it all. Again, notice in verse 1. Who he ascribes the earth and everything in it to. He doesn't ascribe it to creation itself. Like people say, oh, it's the universe that just all of a sudden created itself. But no, no. he gives it to the God who created the universe. Right, right. Yes. He doesn't ascribe it to creation itself. He shows us that truth. He shows us a truth that can be traced in every square inch of the Bible, and it is that nothing we have is truly ours, and all that we own is truly His. No created thing is worthy enough to ascribe glory or weight to because it fails in comparison to the God who made it. All creation bows to God as the creator over all things. Right. Because of the fall of our hearts, naturally, we want to serve creation rather than the creator, as it says in Romans 1. And when we do this, if we admit it or not, it's actually known in the Bible as idolatry. Ah. And this usually plays itself in three ways. If you want to check yourself, these are some three ways in which you can check yourself. In this one, 
Does my time show that God is worthy? Mm-hmm. If you ever want to know what you prioritize, just take a look at your schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing is talent. Am I using gifts in a way that acknowledges God as the creator over them? Am I building God's kingdom or his? Right. Every now and then we'll always hear about having a vision for your life and a plan for your life. And I think we all need to, as I think the Bible would elevate that. But my question to you, does it have, is it rooted in God's vision? Right. Is it rooted in God's plan? Right. Right. Is God's plan the one that is driving your decisions, shaping your motives? Is it God's plan? Mm-hmm. Do you prioritize them? Am I exercising these gifts out of the salvation that I have received or the fame and recognition from others? Right. Right. These are right. things we also right. ought to wrestle with. Treasure. Does my bank statement show that God's mission as glorious? A major misconception in giving is that God needs your money. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. We don't give because God needs everything. We give because we acknowledge that God has blessed us with everything. In Israel, in Israel, they would give to God their sacrifices and offerings instead of their, but sadly, they neglected their obedience. Right, That's right. Right. And God felt the need in Psalm 50 to correct them, and he happened to say this in verse 2 through 13, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the, of the I know all the birds of the hills, and all the move, all the, uh, all the people in the right. fields are mine. Right. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and all its fullness are mm-hmm. mine. Church is the square inch that God does not scream on. And if God owns everything, that means he's in lack of nothing. So how prideful it is of us to think that God's glory is dependent upon what we give him. God is worthy of our time, talent, and treasure. And if God is the sovereign Lord over all things, that, mean, that, means, that, in, that means that we ought to be able to give him all of our best. For he is the one who is worthy to be praised. This king of glory owns it all. But not only is this king of glory Lord over all, but then David, he moves from seeing God's lordship over all things to the holiness of God and what he desires of his people. Right. Truth number two, this king of glory is holy and desires nothing less than our holiness. Mm. Verses three through six, it says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in this holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Right. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Yes, Lord. Such is the generation of those who seek him and who seek the face of the God of Jacob. David now brings the attention from who God is to who shall ascend in his presence. Ooh. Mount Zion has spoken, um, has spoken as God's chosen place. On the earth to dwell, uh, to bear resemblance to his heavenly re- residence. So in this, so in these verses, what we see is that this king of glory is holy and desires nothing less than our holiness. David breaks this down in two ways. First, he says those who have access, and secondly, the blessings of those who have access. Those who have access, God absolutely cares about how we live and the disposition of our hearts. Right. In other words, righteous deed flowing from a righteous heart. God's holy attribute is not just what He requires of His people, but what He knows is best for His people. Hmm. Something people often get wrong about Christianity is that some that it and it separates itself from all other religions is that it's a, it's all about doing the right things, mm-hmm. but it's one that actually calls for having the right heart behind it. God is not God is just as concerned of our deeds and motives on Monday through Saturday as He is about our hearts on Sunday. Good deeds alone will never get anyone into the gate, but it's right deeds. Followed by right behavior. Ah, that's it. Or sorry, followed by a righteous heart. As God is holy, he desires nothing less than our holiness. The word holy simply means to be set apart. Right. To be set apart in scripture was to be separated or consecrated through the use of God's service. That means that the priests were consecrated. The temple was consecrated. Even the utensils used in the sacrifices were consecrated. The Israelites were not new to this. When God was rescued, the people of Israel, out of the hands of the Egyptians, tells, um, he tells Moses in Leviticus 19 and 2, speak to all the congregation of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Deuteronomy 18 13, he says, you must be blameless before the Lord your God. 
This is in the Old Testament. Some people may say, oh, okay, well, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. No, 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 no. They are all the same. For it said, for Jesus in the New Testament, describing how he came to fulfill the law and not abolish it, and Matthew says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments wow. and teaches others to do the same will be called at least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This king of glory is the king who is holy. Hmm. What David was calling the people to do is to assess themselves yeah. in comparison to who they are before this king of glory. The question we ought to ask ourselves when it comes to this is that, are we worthy? Are we worthy to stand in God's presence? Don't worry, I'm going somewhere. Now, church, I want to be clear here. In our natural sinful state, we do not deserve to be in the presence of God. Paul makes it clear in Romans 3, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one in their own strength is pure enough to enter through the gate. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what I love about the Bible is that it says that over 2,000 years ago, this same holy God made a way. Over 2,000 years ago, there was one whose righteousness exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees, the one who fulfilled God's law to perfection. He lived the life that you and I could not live, and therefore he died the death that we deserve to die, so that all who may repent and believe upon him for salvation may have eternal life. For in Romans 5 makes it plain, for while we were weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for one scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, do not try to tender your way to coming before God just because you feel that you are unclean. God is the one who will make you clean. We all have stained garments, but guess what? God offers his robes of righteousness. And that is the message of the gospel, and that alone is the message that saves. And the only response that one can give when our sins have been atoned for is to worship him out of a heart of devotion. That means that we no longer have to live according to to our sins and defined by our guilt and dominated by our sinful nature. For whatever your worst sin is, whatever your deepest and most embarrassing point of shame, whatever is your darkest secret that for some of you has been hindering you from coming to the feet of Jesus Christ, understand this, there is no sin that is too dirty that God's blood cannot cleanse. Someone had to stand in between the gap between us and God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And when you give your life over to God, as Paul says, it is no longer we who live, but it is Christ who lives within us. There happened to be an old school theologian by the name of Augustine. And before he became the Bishop of Hippo and was converted to Christianity, he had actually engaged in a sexual relationship for years, right. for roughly about 10 years. And there was one day he started walking. And as he started walking, eventually, someone from his past, his mistress, decided to say, Hey, Augustine, it's me, Augustine, it's me. And I guess he says, Well, try to, to address it. So he kept on moving, he kept on walking. And, he, and she ends up saying, Hey, Augustine, it's me, Augustine, it's me. And he finally decides to turn around and he said, I know, but it is no longer me. Ah, now, <laughs> it is no longer me. What happens at salvation is that upon faith in Christ, the upon faith in Christ, God is God's life is now birthed into the soul of the sinner. So now we can have the right motives. We can no longer give in to the tendency of our ability to slander one another. You know, to deceive one another. Because it's no longer us who lives, but it's Christ who lives within us. And I want to be clear, being saved doesn't mean you'll live a sinless life, but what it does mean is that you will sin less in this life. Understand this, as Charlie Dace happened to say it this way, God's grace anticipates our rebellion, and yet it ensures us of our salvation. God's grace is that which saves. So let there be nothing standing in the way of you giving your life over to Christ today, because access to God remains available. And then afterwards, David, he says, he says of those who, who have access, but then now he speaks of the blessings of those who have access. Mm -hmm. It says the ones who, who sees and serves this uh, glorious king now will benefit of all of his gifts for eternity. But, now, but what does that mean for us today right now? 
That means access to God now means having a father who will answer you when you call. Well, access to God now means having a divine protector who will keep you safe from the snare and of the pestilence. Access to God now means having a comforter in your affliction. Access to God now means joy in your affliction, hope in times of distress and despair. And it means that all of these and the rest of God's promises are yes and amen. But where do they find their yes and amen? It is in Christ Jesus. Right. The good news of this text is that those who serve this King of glory have access to enter into his glory. Therefore, this King of glory is worthy of our devotion. So wrapping up now, as we see how David starts with praising God because he's Lord over all things and then reminding the people of how he's holy and desires nothing less than our holiness. Now, lastly, we see that this King of glory is simply worthy to be praised. Yes. In verses 7 through 10, it says, Lift up your gates. Oh, lift up your gates, O ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory yes. may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. Of hosts is the king of glory. What this text is saying is that this king of glory is one who is worthy of our worship. David praises God as a victorious king in poetic fashion and announces for the gates to be lifted up in response to the one who's entering in. Notice this. When David, when David asks for the gates to be lifted, he didn't say so that I can come in, but instead he says so that this king of glory may come in. Right. David acknowledges this king as a king who is glorious and who is worthy of all. Someone to be prioritized, someone yeah. to be honored, someone who is worthy of the worship of our hearts. Yeah. And that is what it means for us to serve and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, this, and this same king of glory who brought them victory over the Philistines is the one who will bring us victory in our times of trouble. Yeah. That is the God in whom we serve. This same king of glory at one point entered into our humanity. Yes, sir. And he came in our place. He entered into Hades, but after he defeated the death, hell, and the grave, he well, got up. Well, well. He got up. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yes, he got up. He entered, and then he entered into glory and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Yes, sir. In this same King of glory. Yes, sir. Who offers his hand of salvation to all. He is the one yes. who knocks. He is the one in Revelation who knocks and stands at the door. And for those who hear his voice, he will open the door and he promises to come in and dine with you. Well and this is the only king I know who died on behalf of peasants. Yes, sir. To God be the glory. Yes, Great things he has done. Yes, so loved he the world that he gave his son who yielded his life for an atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Yeah. Praise the Lord. May the people hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. May the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory for great things he has done. I have one closing question. Yes, Do you find this king as glorious? To the one who doesn't want to give their lives over to Jesus because they fear giving up everything that they've been holding on to. They want to hold on to the sins of their past. I want you to understand this, that our sins always overpromise and underdeliver. Right. They oh. never fulfill. They never satisfy. So I am telling you, come. Come to the one who offers the bread of life. Come to the one who offers living water and promises to always satisfy. Mm -hmm. Jesus makes for a better Savior than anything you can turn to. Yes, sir. So my appeal to you today is for you to throw yourself, throw yourself upon this Savior. Throw yourself upon this King of glory. For in His presence, there is fullness of joy. And at His right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And answer the knock while He still knocks. Yeah. Make the decision today. Let your repentance be to seek the God of Jacob. Because the opportunity to knock will not always be there. So if you feel the Lord speaking to you today, if you feel the Spirit prodding at your heart, my appeal to you today is that you would answer. Answer the call of God. Answer the call of salvation upon your life. And then for the one who's a believer, the one who said, hey, I have already placed faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to know that this King of glory is worthy to be praised. We have all been those who... Those, for some of us, have tasted and seen the glory of God. We have tasted and seen the goodness of God. 
But and we also know that we have also tasted the bitter fruit of our past sins. Yes. So therefore, I say to you, rejoice in the salvation that you receive. Rejoice in the King of Glory that you serve, and not only that, but make it known to others. Ah. Yeah. For this song was not just a song to prepare hearts for worship, but it was actually a song to prepare people for mission. Yeah. And it's when we think about the sanctuary that is now being renovated and won't be long until we're meeting together again. I want us to be thinking about how in which we can show that this King of Glory is worthy, maybe by actually sharing the gospel with others. That this King of Glory would so captivate our hearts that we would go out and share this message to others. That is my prayer for this church. For Jesus said that upon this rock, he will build his church. He didn't say that he would build the pew. The church is not a building, but instead it is a people, and he is still adding to his church today. So I say rejoice and do all, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. Live for the glory of God now, as the King of glory is worthy to be praised. I'm done. thank you for the precious blood of your son and we thank you for the simple fact that you are a king who is worthy to be praised. You are worthy of the affections of our hearts. You are worthy of us bringing to you all that we have. And God, I thank you because you are big enough to handle all of it. I pray, Father, that if there be anyone here who heard this message and, is, and, is, and knows that there is something else seated on the throne of their hearts, I pray that they will repent and turn to the God of Jacob. The God who answers us in our prayers, the God who answers our prayers, I pray that they may turn to you and seek salvation, for it is only in your name in which you say. So God, I ask that you be working within our hearts, Lord, and Father, as we also aim to leave this place. Yes, sir. I pray, Father, that you would prepare our hearts for eternity. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. I pray that we do all things to the glory of God in Christ.
did his homework, he's stellar, he's steady, and he presented us a wonderful word that should press all of us dear to our heart. Like a little helicopter, wasn't it? I'm like a 727, I gotta get a long runway. But God does it. We had a lesson very far you could tell that he really studied that word of God. And we are very, very proud of him. And what he did in the spirit of God that blessed us. I think he's the 23rd son of the church that has given his life to Christ and has become one of our ministers. We had a fish Sunday. I said, he more than just a musician. I called him early this morning. I said, well, get ready for August. This Sunday in August. And I might play the piano. I don't know. I back him up a little bit. And I push all of them out so that we will be able to hear our licentious preachers. Uh, our minister of uh, the Holy Youth, he's coming up soon. And I may remember... Uh, well, the Reverend Charles Andre <laughs> Birch on, on, went out on the parking lot and he was humming. I said, please start doing that. And he did a great job in Brown. He, he, uh, so we heard him and we we're just very thankful for all of our preachers. They all had their own specific gifting and we're very proud. Now, we have a resident prayer, and that's uh, the Reverend Dr. Overseer Bishop. <laughs> uh, Johnny, Mr. Johnny is just a, 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 a gift to the church. He loves the Lord, and he had an opportunity to go with us to uh, Erie, and all of the bishops and the overseers fell in love with this young fellow. He was just very busy. I think it was a surprise to see uh, that many bishops in one place, and we all love his love one another and all of us practice our own little gifts and we had a wonderful time there and hopefully we'll be coming in September. We have our gathering again and it's going to be something to behold. But again I want to thank, I don't want to take anything off of uh, little Stefan. I can't call him that anymore. He grew up today. <laughs> and I'm so glad I'm coming here to play about the father did. So I'm just thankful. <laughs> His dad is a stellar young man. We love him. He's doing a phenomenal job as our uh, superintendent over this whole building project. He's doing a phenomenal job. He, he doesn't take anything light. He's very professional what he does. He has end up in the whole crew. So we're happy, hopefully, to get back in very soon. What's our anticipated date? This week that was on July 1st. July 1st. We're moving very fast and uh, now, I'm trying to get another movie uh, going through the building so you can see how, how fast it's advancing. So get ready, because we are ready to see the year they just put down the town. They're going to put the carpet down in a couple, about another week. About another week. And some other things that are happening. We are very, very excited. And whatever you do, make sure your name go on that wall of fame that will be placed in infamy, in infamy that you have contributed to the advancement of this church. That's part of your um, uh, church covenant. But the expense and advancement of this church, we want to make sure we do that for the coming generations. Thank God again. Thank God for my son and, and Jalen. Hey, Jalen almost shouted on the drums. <laughs> I've been preaching my head out. He's been asleep, but no. But he was up and he was almost shouting on the drums. And that's what it is. That's what it's all about. Each one, each one. So we're going to ask him to come and do our benediction in his own way. And he's growing a beard and everything. At 26, 24. 24 years old. 24 years old and preach like that. Thank God from time. He has a lot of years ahead of him. And we're very proud of him. And I made the grace of God. You know, Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide henceforth now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.